but I sure do love them, and I sure appreciate all of you uh, that have come together tonight, and there are some of you that may wonder, so well, Pastor Myers, me and my wife, you know, we're, we're old and gray, and we don't know that this will really mean a whole lot to us, and uh, I would beg to differ with you because I think that as a church, we are a community of people who help hold each other accountable and also to encourage one another. And as a body of believers, if you have been in the faith for years, you're a pillar in your church. I believe there's a certain level of responsibility to have a discernment that when young people and others are going through the valley and they're having hardships in their relationships or marriages. There's enough love and discernment, compassion among their church family that they pick up on it. And in picking up on it, that they're able to put their arm around them or call them or text them, let them know. Because one of the many things that we're going to talk about tonight has a lot to do with the fact that so many fall out of this race as a result of feeling like they are by their self. That they have no body. They have no outlet. They would like to speak to somebody, but they can't. Some of them have convinced themselves they cannot, and some, they love their spouse so much that they feel like that it would be a disservice or dishonor to expose weakness. And so they internalize it until it comes to a place that they can no longer maintain. And we've watched a lot of marriages fall apart as a result. But tonight we'd like to obey the Lord and just follow the course of what God's laid on our heart. There are just so many things that have been brewing in my spirit over the last couple of weeks. This is something that Sister Wendy had reached out to me quite some time ago. And as she had mentioned when we were talking together, timing is very important to us. And I believe that as we have come together tonight, that there is a reason for that. And whether it be the people that see it online, the people that are here, I believe that God had a purpose for this very timing. You never know who's going through what. Because we do well at sometimes covering over the greatest hardships that are going on behind closed doors. And a lot of these struggles no one likes to talk about. But I'd like to tell you this evening that the burden that the Lord has placed on not just my heart but on your pastor's heart comes from a place of concern. Yes. Concern over the unfortunate realities that we as ministers see and have seen. Right. I know that Sister Wendy and I have talked about this before as friends and ministry. Seeing people that you've worked so hard to encourage and help and watch them completely fall out and away from church because their marriage or their relationship fell apart. You were doing everything you could to preach the word of God to them. You were getting anointed. You were praying, having prayer meetings and events and meetings and such as that. But when they walked out of the church, they went home to situations that they didn't talk to anybody about. And that's the kind of people that I would like to talk about tonight because that is a concern on our part. Concern for the many wives and husbands that have been too intimidated, too embarrassed. Because there are some things that we just don't talk about. Because it doesn't sound real spiritual. There are just some things that we, we don't talk to our parents about. Because we're too embarrassed. We're afraid of what they may think. There are wives that don't go to their mother and say, what do you do in this situation? Because they're afraid that their mother will hold hard feelings against right. their spouse. Right. There are situations where that people will not share things because they're afraid of how the church may continue to treat them. 
And it might blow your mind tonight, but there are people that would love to reach out to somebody, but because they're in a position, they sing, they play an instrument, people look up to them. They know that even though people say in their heart they forgive them, that they will be weighed by the things that they say. Even if it's just a season of their life, they will always be measured by people because of the things that they share from their heart. So this concern that God has laid on our heart is to bring people to a place that they can consider the answers that come from spiritual insight, wisdom, experience, in hopes that they can survive. I'll talk about this later, but I had reached out to numerous individuals, couples, that I know very well. I didn't want to come into this meeting tonight ill-prepared. But I knew that there were a lot of people that have gone through some intense, raw, real stuff. Right. The kind of stuff that I said earlier that we don't talk about. Yeah. Some of them are still going through these things. Some of them have survived them and made it on the other side. Some of them I've counseled with. Some of them are friends of ours. Some of them are people we've known for years. But I've reached out to them and I said, share with me some of your concerns, the things that you wanted to ask but couldn't, the things that you struggled or have struggled or are struggling with now. Yes, Lord. And in doing so, I realized how quickly these people were ready to jump on board reminded me yeah. of how badly we need this. Yeah. Yeah. Because every person that I reached out to who has gone through the pain of marriage and relationship struggle, they knew what that pain was like and how deep that it was. They wanted somehow to interject something into this service and tomorrow night's service yeah, come on. in hopes that it might help somebody who is or was just like them. So it's our desire tonight as we stand in unity, Sister Wendy and I together, that the kind of discussions that we will have tonight, we may not have all of the answers, but at least we can have the kind of engaging conversations that will hopefully lead to the answers that people need. There's one thing that I will go ahead and qualify tonight and tell you. It bothers me when other ministers, leaders, people pretend like they know everything. And when you ask them something just for the sake of sounding like that they've got it all together, they will make something up and throw it out there. Yes. I've made it up in my mind for the years that when someone asks me something as a pastor or as a confidant, that if I don't know the answer, that I will tell you, yeah. I don't really know. Amen. I think people can respect and appreciate that. Yeah. And the truth is that even the most well-versed, learned preacher, minister, and person among us would have to admit there are situations and things that people have brought to us that completely caught us off guard. After all of the years of pastoring to this day, I have times that someone will present a situation to me that blows me out of the water. But one thing I can assure you is that we can engage in the kind of conversation that helps people realize, even if I don't get the answer that I need tonight, I am able to realize I am not the only one going through this. Because I want to assure you tonight that the enemy has done a very good job of making a lot of young people, young married couples and individuals feel like there's something wrong with you. I'm not saying that there are not things that you cannot work on. But am I right tonight by telling you that the enemy likes to beat you down? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. 
you watch Hallmark movies or you see what appears to be picture-perfect relationships and then you size your relationship up with couple X, Y, Z. And then you walk away wondering what's wrong with my marriage. But I can assure you tonight that everybody has problems. Even people that feel like you have a good marriage tonight, can you, can you say amen with me? Amen. We all have our issues. But I'd like to cultivate that kind of uh, uh, conversation tonight. From my personal experience, I can share with you tonight that I will, I have to admit that, like I said, I, I don't know every answer. And um, I'll have to admit to you that I am not a degreed psychologist or psychiatrist. My wife and I don't have plaques or degrees to hang on the wall and tell people I am a XYZ sort of uh, psychiatrist. But what I can assure you is, is that through the wealth of many years of experience, that we can share that with you. And I have learned that degrees have their place, and I take nothing away from that. But nothing supersedes experience. Because we have been through a lot. When people look at my wife and I's relationship, we often hear, I wish I had a husband like you, or I wish I had a wife like you have. We hear that a lot. But it would surprise a lot of people if you understood that our marriage has not always been model worthy. There has been a lot of maturity, a lot of growing, and a lot of toleration to get to where we're at. The husband that you see her with tonight is not the same guy she married. Nor is the wife that I have tonight the one that I married whenever we first said our vows. We've been together now for close to 30 years, married, and been together for somewhere around 34. That's quite a, an accomplishment for someone who is our age. I'm 49, and she is 47. That means that we have spent the greater part of our life married and together. Can you say amen? That's a great accomplishment. Amen. I give God all the credit and glory for all of that. Yes, but I want you to realize tonight, in keeping with the theme that the Spirit of God has laid on Sister Wendy's heart in these two nights, the power of two, yeah. that I have to follow the spiritual guidance that God has given me to bring some things to your understanding. The first thing I'd like for you to see is that we need to be reminded tonight that what it is that makes the union of two people together so powerful. If we can take a moment and read a verse that God gave me as a benchmark, if not at least for tonight and possibly tomorrow night, and you have your Bible and you like to turn there tonight, and if you haven't already picked up on this, this will not be your typical service tonight. If we don't run aisles or jump pews, if we can save a marriage or help somebody, I will walk away feeling like that great things have been accomplished. But Amos chapter 3 and verse number 3. I want to read this one verse tonight, and I want to use this, as I said, as a, a benchmark for many of the things that we're going to talk about. Here in just a little while, I'm going to have my wife come up and we're going to collaborate together. But Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, if you have it, can you say amen? amen. I'll give you a minute because I hear a few pages still turning. If you're watching online, you're listening, I want to encourage you to share a video or audio with people who you know may could use that marriage and relationship help. This is a very familiar verse for many of us, but I feel like that within the confines of this text is a wealth of information in just a few words. The Bible says here, Can two walk together except they be agreed? This is a question. When God asks us a question, it is, a, it is meant to stir the thought process within us. It is meant for you to pause and reflect when God asks you a question. He wants you to think about what it is that He has presented to you. 
And in this situation, God is revealing to us, can two people, I want you to picture tonight, a husband and a wife, a boyfriend and a girlfriend. How can they walk together except they be agreed? Now, on the surface, we read that and we think about the fact that the Bible says agreed. Because I believe tonight that what God is showing the church is that the power of two is in their agreement. Their ability to come together. When I read this verse and the Spirit of God pointed it out to me, my mind went back to my youth and to many different festivities and things that we've been to through the years has anyone ever been involved in or you've seen it uh where they do like croaker sack races anybody remember those i've seen it done a couple of different ways i've seen it done where that they have a croaker sack and you get one person puts one leg in and the other person puts their leg in and they try to run with one leg in the croaker sack i've also seen it before where they get in the croaker sack together it takes a pretty big croaker sack for some folks. But they get a croaker sack. They put it, put the people in the croaker sack, whether it's one leg or both. And they challenge them to run toward the finish line. When I read this verse, I thought, Lord, is that not like marriage and relationships in so many ways? You've got two people who are used to walking on their own. But now because of a union that has brought them together they now must learn to walk and and get to the finish line while doing it together now we can walk beside each other without the croaker sack but if i could tell you tonight that the croaker sack is a commitment that croaker sack says we're doing this together and to bring us together that commitment means we have to learn that when you throw your right leg forward, I need to be able to throw my leg right forward. You see, the thing that confuses a lot of people is they, they think that when you say you have to walk in step or in agreement, they get this idea that we are no longer individuals. We don't have our own feelings. We don't have our own loves and dislikes and likes and opinions. And I believe that when two people come together, it's unique because have you ever met a couple that's been together for years? They laugh the same. You ever met anybody like that? They, they, they say the same stuff. You, you ever met anybody like that? They say the same phrases because they, they spend so much time together. Uh, sometimes my wife and I are like this. My wife just let me know yesterday or day before. She said, I always say, is that right? So now I'm going to have to make sure that I think about that. She always, she said, I'm all the time saying, is that right? I don't know. But she's picked up on that. But I see a lot of people that will, even with my son, uh, there's times that I hear my son say some of the same things that I say because he has spent so much time around me. But listen, with that said, you have to understand that when two people come together, the unity is in their agreement on core values and the, and the goals that God has allowed them to work towards together. This does not mean that your wife has to become you and you have to become your wife. You become as one, but that does not mean that you still don't have, your feelings don't matter because your husband now, you know he's the head of the house and I don't have any right to have an opinion. I don't have the right to have feelings. I don't have the right to like this or dislike that. If I go to the steakhouse and he likes his steak medium rare, I have to get my steak medium rare. But listen, when you come together, what I believe makes a marriage so so beautiful and so unique is that two people, you get two people in a croaker sack and the one is five foot six and the other one's six foot one, one weighs 240 pounds and the other weighs 190 and they're both trying to race toward the finish line. What I think is beautiful is that we're so unique with our differences, but yet we learn with the help of the Spirit how to get to the finish line with God's help. Can you say amen to that? I believe that that is a beautiful thing that we can accomplish and we do it together. But from the biblical standpoint, that the power of two is in the, is in the agreement. 
And for any marriage to work, and I want you to listen, if you've just got married, you've been married forever, it doesn't matter. This, this rings true for everybody. For any marriage to work, that has to be a coming together and a season and a time of compromise and meeting in the middle. You cannot always have your way and a marriage work fluid. There has to be some give and take within the marriage. If you are young and you think that it's always got to be your way, that's the reason why you're having so many uh, controversies in your relationship. You have to value each other's feelings and opinions so much that every so often that you give them the ability and they give you the ability to make some decisions together. Someone say amen to that. Amen. So an agreement is core values, goals in the, in the marriage. It's the ability to walk and step with one another in a unified support. Now, this word support is so important to me. And believe it or not, tonight it's important to you. And I'm going to show you the reason why. Because one of the biggest things as a pastor who has counseled numerous people through the years... And I've watched in my own relationship as our relationship has evolved over these last 34 years. If you do not feel supported in your relationship, you feel like your relationship is not where it needs to be. And I want you to understand that whether it is a wife, a girlfriend, a husband, a boyfriend, you have to understand that that person with feelings needs to feel supported within that relationship. If they feel like that their values and their goals and they feel like that their feelings have no regard to you, everything is about what you want and what you think, you're going to have a miserable marriage. That person needs to feel supported. And that may look like a lot of different things for a lot of different people. For some people in a marriage, especially when you have kids involved, they need to feel supported in their parenting. There are times that I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be up open and upfront with you. One of the biggest uh, marriage struggles that I see, people think a lot of times, well, if you have kids, that will make our relationship better. I'm just going to tell you that helps in some ways, but in most part, it just com makes more complexity to the whole overall relationship. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because now you not only have two people trying to work out their differences, but you got, now you've got two people who are trying to agree and disagree on how do we discipline the kids. Whose parents, whose in-laws do we go to for Christmas? Where do we go for Thanksgiving? And what church are we going to attend? No, my kids are not going to your mama's house. Your mama is a liar and a thief, and I don't care for your mama. And no, we're not going to come on. Is there one of what I'm saying? What you now have to do, you now have to contend. No, the baby's not going to wear huggies. My mama raised me. We always wore the other generic brand, and that's what we're going to buy. Because, But the baby's got allergies, and you don't understand what I mean. When you add children, you add more complexity to the relationship. And when you do so, you have, to, you have to realize that your spouse needs to feel supported in their values. When they feel like what their feelings are do not matter, you are going to have problems in your marriage. When your husband speaks up and says, babe, I don't really think that that's a good idea. His idea may be the dumbest thing since we launched a man into the moon. But at the same token, you have to make sure you realize that his, his feelings are just as valuable and real as yours. Yeah. Come on and say amen, somebody. Amen. Not just that, but in illness. I can assure you, you know, when we say vows and things like uh, in sickness and in health for better or for worse. Anybody ever say those vows in your marriage? And you've heard that before, traditional marriage vows. When you say in sickness and in health, I can assure you that if you plan to be in the long haul of marriage, there is a very good chance if you got together at a young age or middle age, at some point, somebody's going to get sick. Somebody's going to have some problems. What are you going to do when your high school sweetheart has breast cancer and has to have a double mastectomy? What are you going to do whenever your husband gets uh, cancer and he has to have something removed? What are you going to do when you find out that some part of your relationship develops insecurities later on down the road that you did not have whenever you were young? 
that person needs to feel supported in that. I can assure you that when mama has stretch marks and her body is not the same as it used to be, she needs to feel supported and that she's still beautiful. That somebody still finds her attractive and that she's still a love even when she looks in the mirror and has a hard time loving herself. That husband who begins to go bald or he's not the man that he used to be. He can't do the things that he used to. He needs to feel supported that his, his life matters that someone loves him that someone cares for him can you say amen i don't know if i'll have time later so while this is fresh on my mind i want to interject this because this is not the direction i'm going but i thought about this throughout the last couple of days and i feel that this is very important for some people to really get a hold of and that is a lot of times in relationships you will have some wife or some husband that has insecurities anybody that have any raise your hand you might as well, every one of you, is every one of you got some, you got some big ears, you hate the fact you got big ears, you wear your hair over your ears, you know what I mean? You don't like your, you got that nose from your great grandma's side of family, and you don't like your nose, you know. Everybody's got some insecurities. I don't like how I got so much back fat, you know what I mean? I don't like, you know, just something, I got a mole on the side of my head, and so I turn my head this way when I take pictures. Everybody has got some kind of insecurities. And they need to feel supported in the relationship because those insecurities weigh them down. But here's the problem that I wanted to share with you. A lot of times what I see happen is that a person needs encouragement. But what happens is the person that needs the encouragement often pushes the encouragement away. And after a while they develop a pattern that causes the person that they need the encouragement from to just cut it off. What do you mean by that? Let me explain myself. When, you're, when your husband says, Babe, you are knockout gorgeous today. Stop looking at your husband and saying, I am so fat. I don't even want to hear that. I look terrible. I'm the ugliest mess that any ever walked the planet. If your husband loves you enough to say you are beautiful, even if you don't feel beautiful, your hair's in curlers or your hair's a mess or you just got out of the shower and your hair stuck to you, I just want you to look at your husband and say, thank you. I'm glad you feel that way, even if you don't feel that way about yourself. Because what will happen, sister or brother, because just like today, we were sitting at a meal today, and we were having lunch together. We spent a lot of time together, and my wife looked across the table and smiled and looked at me like a Hallmark movie, and she said, you're so handsome. I, I thought to my first thought that came to my mind, please, girl. You know what I mean? I, first thing I think is, you, you really, you need a new set of glasses. We're going first thing, come into this meeting and getting you a new prescription. That, that's kind of my way of thinking about it. But she said that to me. And you know, I did not rebuke her. I didn't scold her. I just said, thank you, honey. I appreciate that. Because here's what a lot of you don't realize. Some of you are complaining because nobody ever compliments you. The reason some people never compliment you anymore is because you always rebuke them and scold them when they do compliment you. Let them compliment you. Maybe they see in you something you don't see in yourself. And if they think you're beautiful, let them think you're beautiful. Amen. Come on and say amen to that. Amen. amen. But they need to be supported. They need to be supported in ministry. There are some of you tonight that are involved in ministry. And it is very vital that the person that you are connected with knows they are supported in the ministry that God has called you into. Yes. I can tell you and assure you that one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life outside of God and His mercy is my wife. And I'll tell you one of the reasons is because when God called me in the ministry, I have always had my wife's support. Did she agree with every detail and decision along the way? Not always. But in most cases, my wife, whether she wanted to move, whether she liked the decision we were making, she supported me and stood behind me and beside me and with me and let me know I've got your back. There was a period of time several years ago that we had two different individuals, and I think I've shared this before, but there may be somebody that's never heard it. But there was a time before that my wife had some uh, two different people within, I think it was like a week's period of time from two totally different places that said while that they were in prayer that God spoke to them and told them to go to my wife and tell her you are your husband's secret weapon in prayer. 
Now that is very specific. You don't just throw those words together. What was God trying to tell a woman who struggles with great insecurities about her ability to say the right thing, spell the right thing, say it at the right time, encourage the right person, to feel like she deserves to even be a pastor's wife in the first place? God was giving encouragement to let you know you have a place. And that place is right there with your husband. His ministry, because my wife's even told me before, and I know this, I don't want to embarrass her in any way, but she's told me before, babe, I, I appreciate your ministry, but sometimes I feel like a weight to your ministry. You could do this without me. I said, I, even if I could, I wouldn't want to. And I don't believe that I would be the man that I am today because there are people that together we minister to. Anyone agree with that? You could say amen. How many of you believe this morning, uh, this evening, that we need in marriages and relationships to feel supported? I'll tell you another area that we need to feel supported. That is in our mental, emotional, and hormonal changes. I can give you an example of what I'm talking about because you, I tell young couples when I counsel them, uh, I come across a statistic several years ago that they said that over the course of a long-term marriage that it will feel like you're married to at least three different people. Because when you go through stages and ages, your likes and your dislikes, they change. Some of you have been married a long time. Help me out. Amen. There are things that now that you do that you never did before. I never. There's a lot of things. And uh, you're not the same person that you used to be. A lot of life... I used to be honest. There are life experiences that change you. There are hardships you go through that change you. There are things you're going to face in marriage that you'll never be the same. You're not going to be the same person when it's over with. And you might as well accept that and understand that before you even get married, young person. But there are mental, emotional, and hormonal changes. Uh, not too long ago, my wife and I have shared with the church we have gone through some tragic devastating, life-altering things in the last few years. Things that nearly knocked the complete breath out of us. Yeah. Mentally, emotionally, yeah. spiritually. Right. And right in the middle of all of that, my wife turns into a whole, whole different person. Uh -huh. Come on. I, I have been there too. But I noticed a change. Yeah. Oh, Pat. I notice this, this is not typical of my wife. She's been very short with me. She's ready to claw my eyes out. I don't, I just uh, say the least. And everything I say, I think she's taking it the wrong way. Have anybody else ever been there before? Yeah, you on. felt like that? I didn't mean that, what you, what you thought I meant. I mean, you, you, you thought that's what it meant. That's not, not what I meant. <laughs> and I could tell something was not right. Come on, Come on now. But see, we've been together so long, I know her. Right. I know her heart. Yeah. I know her heart. Do you hear me? I know her heart. Right. And I know the person she is. And so when I recognize this, I can either get angry with her, or I can go to prayer about what she's dealing with that's causing yeah. her to be like this. Right. You see, a lot of times people go through changes. Yes. Whether it's postpartum or whether it's the cycle of life, or whether it's uh, some sort of hormonal change that they're dealing with, you have to understand that in those changes, that it is still the same person, but they are dealing with something that they need your support to get through it. Because let me tell you something. You may feel like they don't need your support, but your change is coming. Your time will come. You'll be having a bad day and you're going to need somebody to put up with you. You're going to have somebody who's going to need, you're going to need somebody to love you through your goofiness. Come on. With your aggravation. So you're going to need somebody to tolerate and put up with you on your worst days. Come on. You might as well say amen. But I found out, I told my wife, I went to her and I tried to find the right way, the right timing. There is really no perfect time to go to somebody who's going through what she was going through and say, something's not right with you. Something's not right. Something's not good. Something's changed. Uh -huh. And so you're trying to find the nicest, most gentle, soft, Kleenex soft kind of way to let them in on the fact that something's different. Right. So I told my wife, I said, babe, I'm not real sure, but I think you might be going through menopause. <laughs> she was nice enough, and I caught her at just the right moment for her to tell me. I don't know why I've been crying all the time. 
I have these hot flashes at night. Something's happened. I don't understand what's going on with me. You may be right. And I said, well, you know, I've heard before they have tests that you can take to find out if you are going through menopause. She said, but I, I, I think it just seems crazy. I, don't, I should be too young to be going through menopause. And So she mentioned it to her doctor. And her doctor brushed it off. She said, nah, you're too young to be going through menopause. I told my wife, I said, I think your doctor's wrong. <laughs> Help me out, daughter-in-law. You know her well, too. So my wife talked to another doctor. And this doctor agreed to give her a test. And through blood work, they're able to establish these types of things. Right. And they said, not only are you going through menopause, but you've been going through it for quite a while. Uh -huh. But here's the reason I brought all that up to you, not to embarrass her, because there are a lot of you that go through it. They have something called menopause, too. Whether it's a real scientific term or not, men go through problems think, like, like that as well. But with that being said, my wife needed to know she was supported during a time right. when she embarrassed me in the hospital because my pastor's wife was ready to bite the head off of the charge nurse that came in and wouldn't give her medicine. I knew this was not her. Yeah. I knew this is not how she worked. I knew this is not her personality. Right. Right. She is dealing with something that she needs tolerance. Right. She needs love. She needs yeah. compassion. She needs somebody to know who is on the inside but battling with something on the outside, on. figuratively speaking. And so during that period of time, I remember my wife saying this to me, and she may remember this as well. But she looked at me and she said, why are you being so nice to me? I, she even told me this. She said, I can tell that I've been terrible lately. And she said, you don't say very much. Well, if you'd have got me at about 25 years old, we might not even be together right now. But that's what I'm telling you, that marriages should mature. Yeah. And there needs to be a level of support. Yes. And you know what I told her? I said, babe, you have stuck by my side Come on now. through some of the dumbest choices, right. decisions, You've caught me doing things that I would be embarrassed to say. Come on now. You know things about me nobody else knows. Right. I would be a foolish man Come not on. to stand by your side when you need me the most. Because she has stood by my side when I needed her the most. Right. And I'm not just saying that. I'm being honest with you here tonight. But one word came to my mind as I sought the Lord about the power that comes through our agreement. And I'm about to share something that will really hit home for a lot of people. The one word that I felt like the Spirit of God laid into my heart is compliment. Have you ever heard this word compliment? Well, before you draw a conclusion about the word, I want you to realize that it's important that there are two separate spellings and two different meanings of the word compliment. If we use the letter I and spell compliment with an I, that is the same to say that I take note of some attribute that you have and I'm praising that attribute. Oh, your hair looks so nice. I'm complimenting. Oh, that dress looks so good on you. I'm complimenting you. But there is another compliment that the Spirit laid on my heart that is not that compliment. This compliment is spelled with an E and it means this. To add to something in a way that enhances, improves, or perfects it. How many of you tonight that are married or in a relationship, God help us to complement each other. In other words, help us to enhance, improve, or to perfect each other. We often look over and see what Webster has, has to say, and this is what he said. When something complements something else, it makes it better. What I feel like is that when my marriage is complimented by a wife that compliments me, it makes me a better me. Anyone else agree with that? And so what I want you to also see and keep in mind 
is that when we look at one another and realize that we are complimenting each other with an E, this root word to complement is what? Complete. So in other words, when you compliment someone, you complete that person. When we say things like my other half or my better half, in other words, I am not whole without you, but together we complete each other. Where I am weak, you shine bright. There are things that I don't do well that you do. There are things that you do well that I don't do, but together our strengths are magnified. Can you say praise the Lord for that? So I believe that it is, it is and always has been the desire of God for the union of man and woman to complement or complete each other, which will make each other better together. But with that being said, this does not mean, as I said before, that you cannot have your individual uh, own personalities, your own opinions, your own feelings and such as that, but in your weakness, your spouse or your friend, your companion, you make each other stronger together. But I'm afraid that this right here is why so many relationships fail. <coughs> I want you to compliment your spouse. But you know where we fail? When we should compliment our spouse we end up being in competition with our spouse. When you should be complimenting, you're in competition. <coughs> Who makes the most money? Who's the better parent? Who works the hardest in this house? Who blows the most money? Who loves who the most? No, I love you more. Come on, come on. Who disciplines the kids the best? Who tries hardest to keep the marriage together? Come on, oh, you're not even trying. I'm the one putting all the effort into this marriage. Who's on their phone the most? Come on, come on. I can tell you the reason why some people argue all the time. Because instead of complimenting each other's weaknesses and strengths, <coughs> they're too busy in competition with one another. And I believe tonight that we can see how the competition fuels or is the fuel for most arguments, especially with young couples. Any young couples here tonight say, Amen, Brother Myers, you are telling the truth forevermore. <laughs> but the power of two is also the power of multiplication. You see, you don't just have two people, but now you have four eyes and ears, four hands and feet, 20 fingers and toes, two minds, and one person can rest while the other stands guard. We are stronger together if we will if we will work in agreement together. What I'm about to say comes from many years of experience. Young people, listen very closely. You need to understand this. I know that traditional marriage in some people's mind, they have it framed the way granny and grandpa or a nanny and whoever did it or aunt so-and-so but let me explain to you from a biblical and a spiritual and a place of wisdom. Your marriage is not a dictatorship. A husband is not becoming his wife's new father. A wife is not becoming her husband's new mother. It is meant to and works best when two people are bringing out the best in each other. Not trying to mother, not trying to father, but allowing a person to have their individual interests, likes, opinions, feelings, and such forth, and at the same time working towards the same common goal. Together, we want to see our lost children saved. We may not like the same colors, but we still have the same goals. We may not eat the same food when we get order off the menu at the restaurant, but we still have the same goal that together we want to see great things accomplish soul say ministry going forth and so together we may be unique in our own individual styles but together we agree on the right things so that together we can see God do mighty things through us as a team together and I feel like tonight for this to happen 
We as a couple in a relationship have to take a step back and look at our expectations within and for a marriage. A lot of times when I counsel couples, one of the most recent couples that I sat down with, I asked them, what are you expecting to get out of this relationship? What is it that you're wanting? If you're a young man and you're just hoping for a whole lot of intimacy, you've got the wrong idea about marriage. If you're a young woman and all you're thinking about is I always wanted to have a batch of kids, let me tell you something, I've got the wrong idea about marriage because them kids are going to grow up and y'all are going to be sitting on the porch swing together, come on, picking food out of your teeth. I'm just telling you, you need to understand that you, if you stick in this for the long haul, when the kids are gone, y'all got to be able to deal with each other. Y'all still got to be able to love each other. Y'all still have some common goals and interests. I read a statistic not too long ago that they said that there has been a shift in our cultural norms in the last 25 years that what we are seeing now is after the age of retirement that more older couples are divorcing now than ever at a record rate. They said they didn't understand this, but when they started doing some evaluation, they began to realize that part of the reason is, is that these are the people whose kids have just moved out and gone to college. What they have done, they sit across the room looking at each other and now they no longer feel that they have nothing in common. They've spent all of their time taking the kids to ball practice and karate and children's church and they've had plans together and everything in their marriage was centered around the children. Let me tell you, your children are vital and important, but if you don't maintain the fire in the passion in your relationship, you can build everything around ministry, everything around the children and when the children move out, you don't have anything to hold on to because you build nothing but the child. You still have to spend time with one another. Say amen somebody. But it goes without saying tonight that the single greatest thing that has happened in our marriage was both of us got saved. But aside from that, tonight, I give a lot of credit to the patience and toleration that we have both had for each other while we matured. I said it earlier, I'm not the husband I used to be, not the one that she married. And I've joked around about this, but in, a, in somewhat of a serious tone, I, I've told some young men before, if you really want a good wife, find you one that will put up with you until you turn into a man. You really want a good wife, find one who will put up with you until you become a man. I can only speak from the male perspective because I am a man, but I'm sure, ladies, that shoe fits as well on the other side. Because through the years, I haven't always made the greatest choices. And there were painful places of our relationship that my wife had to put up with while she stood at a distance and watched me mature. We have a lot of younger couples that look at our marriage and they think, well, we just wish we had that kind of marriage. But listen, young people, this marriage did not happen overnight. It took a lot of, took a lot of tears. It took a lot of arguments behind the scenes that nobody knew about. It took two people that were willing to survive some of the most difficult things yeah. a couple can go through. Right. It was 2008. We had just gone to Grace Street Church of God to pastor. My wife, she had set a goal. She had just lost a whole lot of weight. She was super excited. She's 47 now. This was 2008. You do the math about how old she was. We were done. We didn't really have any desire to have any kids. But she... Came up pregnant. After a period of time, we embraced the idea that she was pregnant. She went through the changes. She began to put on weight. We made plans. We made preparations. We started buying things. We started thinking of baby names. And then she miscarried. A pastor and a pastor's wife who try to be there encouraging other people when they go through hardships and there I sat in a hospital while my wife was having a DNC by myself 
You want the kind of marriage that we have, I'm going to tell you something. You've got to be a survivor. Someone say, Lord, help me be a survivor. You have to know how to embrace those challenges and get through them, even though. And when you start looking around you, young man or young woman, and you look at that other girl and you think she's so beautiful, she's shown me attention, I can have a wife like that. Let me tell you something. You might get what you think you need and lose everything you ever had. You better pay attention because if God put you in a marriage union, you better be thankful for what you have and recognize what you have right now. Say amen, folks. Amen. amen. So I give a lot of credit to the, the patience that she's had. At this time, I want to ask my wife, if she will, to come up because we're going to, I've asked her, invited her to collaborate together with me on a vital part of this. How long have we been going tonight? If it's been too long, we'll shut her down. Amen. Sister Wendy said, I had a little bit more time. You cannot pack 10 pounds of sugar in a five-pound bag without going a little long. So if you will bear with me, I promise you, I will try to shut this thing down at the right time. But when God put this in our heart to talk about, I knew there are real people in our churches that are dealing with real stuff and we can get up here and gloss over it and sound super spiritual and miss the opportunity to deal with real life stuff. What kind of real life stuff are you talking about? Stuff like this. I reached out to one sister. The first time I met her was at a funeral. And after the end of the funeral, I had sat down on the bench outside of the church. And she came to get rest, sat down. She introduced herself to me. We began to talk a little bit. And within a matter of a few minutes, with tears in her eyes, she looked at me and she said, I don't have any reason, I don't know the reason why that I'm sharing these things with you. I just feel like you may have the answers and then I can trust you. What she share with you, Pastor Myers? Grief. Come on. Pain that ran so deep Come on, brother. that she was still grappling with the pain and how do I process this and still hold on to my faith in God. Come on. It's real. Sister Wendy, she shared with me how that she was in a marriage. For years, many years. Her husband would get up and sing in the church. A lot of people admired him because he could sing very well. He had a position. He had clout. And this man she had been married to for many years, who that she had given her whole life to, dedicated her whole life to. I want to say that it was after about eight or ten years one day she found out that for the last eight or ten years he had been molesting her son and her daughter. Both of them were in church. By all accounts, you should expect that you could trust. But this man that she laid next to every night, this man that she shared her deepest feelings and emotions with, this man that should have complimented her was destroying her in the area of her life that for most mothers means everything to you. Your children. These are the kind of real people that the Spirit of God dealt with me. People just like that to reach out to. I had a path. I had a direction, Sister Wendy. I shared this with her last night or the night before. But when I sat down, I felt like the Spirit of God told me. Come on. Reach out to some young people, some couples. Reach out to couples that you know have been through things. Ask them to give you some of the questions they would have liked to have asked somebody when they felt like they were dying. Come on now. Some of them, the way they feel right now. Right. I could get up here and I could tell you that... God took a rib out of Adam's side and 
a lot of the many things that many of you already know. But for the next few moments, if you'll bear with us, I would like to talk about some very difficult to talk about things. I've asked my wife if she would read. I don't know if we could use this microphone. Will this reach over here, Sister Wendy, or do you know? Here, I'll just allow her to, to use this. I've asked her to read some of the questions. I couldn't read them all. There's no way. Some of these questions, if you'd have read them, they'd have just about made you cry. But I had to condense it down because we don't have enough time to read every one of them. But I tried to bring them together because you'd be surprised how similar some of the things were. So I'm going to ask my wife to do that. Will you give my wife a hand? Let her know you appreciate her tonight. There was a betrayal of trust in our marriage. I forgave them, but it shook. But the, the shock of the sin has broken my heart spiritually. How can I regain confidence in their walk with faith? Amen. So this young individual or a time in their life of youth, having a spouse who has a sin in their life that has broken trust, what they're essentially asking is, how can I regain confidence in their walk of faith? Husbands and wives, you have to realize that we give each other a certain level of trust and respect. When that is broken, or if I can better say injured, sometimes that's a devastating blow that we try to continue on, but in the background, hurting. And if I could answer this question for this person, I would have to tell them that injured trust is like a wound that takes time to heal. With that being said, both parties have to take consideration the offended and the offender. I know that sometimes whenever you have hurt a spouse, and I have, That it could be easy for you to say, you know what the Bible says, forgive. You need to get over it. That was a year ago. That was two years ago. Get over it. I understand that a lot of times that's how quickly some people just want to sweep things under the rug as though they were never... The things you said that brought them to tears. That every time that you tell them they're beautiful, they can still hear the ugly things you said about them while you were arguing. They can still hear those words. And you just, you want them to forget it. Let me tell you, if you're the offender and you've committed a sin in your relationship, you have stepped out, you have got involved in infidelity or something is known in that relationship, you have to acknowledge the fact that even though forgiveness is a reality, that you messed up. You made a mistake. It's not right for somebody to hold something over your head for the rest of your life. But because of what you have done, it's the same way that if I injure my leg and I break it, I cannot step out tomorrow and expect that I can go run in a marathon. Neither can you expect your spouse who you have injured deeply because believe it or not, there are some people whenever you, when you tell them you love them and they sign up for marriage, they throw their heart over the moon for you. And when you crush them, you crush them deeper than you can imagine. Maybe you don't see it that way, but they did. And when that trust is injured and when that person has been wounded in such a, in such a deep, deep way, every time that you think about it, you have to remind myself, yourself, I brought this on myself. I have nobody else to blame. So instead of pushing it off on them, well, you need to forgive me. You need to accept the fact that you are guilty and you messed up. Now for the person that has been offended, you have to also realize that the only way 
that there can ever be progress in any relationship is for you as an individual to pray through your healing and open up the doors of opportunity for renewed trust. You can't hold that person hostage for the rest of their life for something that they did a while back. If they are never given an opportunity to redeem themselves in that relationship, then you should forfeit your own salvation to, in, in the Lord. Because He has forgiven you as well. I often have people say, Pastor Myers, and this is part of some of the questions that I didn't have time to get into the details of all of them, but I have this question asked all the time. I was hurt. How do I forgive them? Let me give you one of the best pieces of advice. I give this advice often. The easiest way for you to learn how to forgive somebody is take a minute, pause, reflect back, and think about every dumb thing you've ever had to go to God and say, forgive me, show me mercy. Because when you do that, you'll be able to see that there have been times you fell before the Lord and said, God, I messed up. And if God was good enough to forgive you, that it's time for you to start moving forward, sister or brother, instead of holding a person hostage for every time that they've messed up. Put it in the past, bury it, and move on and let God help you through this healing process. The, the second question. Go ahead, Sister Myers. My spouse has a secret sin. How can I intercede and pray for them when I'm so angry about it? My spouse has a secret sin. How can I intercede when I'm so angry? With what they are doing. Could it be that in this situation. They're angry about the person. Thinks nobody knows. Could it be because they feel like. Their spouse is being a hypocrite. Let me shed a little light on that for you tonight. You've got to pray for that person. Knowing. That it, if, if, if it is a secret sin. There's a good possibility that you may be the only person that knows about what they're doing. What does that mean, Brother Myers? That means that you could very well be the only person standing between them and hell. Right. You should pray like you are. Yeah. Yes. How do I pray for them? How do I go about? How can I pray them? I'm so angry with them. This is one of those times that as a, as a minister, I'm going to tell you that you need to put your feelings on the altar and you need to pray for them like they could die lost if you don't intercede on their behalf. Pastor, I know things that they are doing that nobody else knows about. I just want you to know that if nobody else knows about it and if they can't count on you, if God can't count on you to intercede for them, who is going to? Come on now. You might be a mother tonight. Say, I'm not even married, Pastor Myers. Are my kids doing X, Y, Z? If you're the only one that knows about it, you might be the only one that can intercede for them. Stop letting your feelings get in the way of you being able to minister for them and through them with the help of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Number three tonight. Go ahead, Sister Myers. My husband is passive, which means I have to make decisions that I should be making. How do I get him... To assume the role of a spiritual head of our home. You know, tonight this is kind of a touchy subject for a lot of people because we come up in the idea with traditional homes and such as that. And we do believe, at least I hope that we all agree on the fact that the Bible says that the husband is supposed to be the head of the house. But in there are situations like this where this wife has said, you know, my husband's a very passive individual. And I don't know what I need to do to get him to make the decisions and assume the role of the spiritual head of our home. I get tired of always having to be the one to step up to the plate and make decisions. Right. Well, there are several things that I have to bring to your attentions because this opens up a whole new conversation about having real effort on both persons' part before you're ever going to flip the script. Because the reason why some relationships are thus is because of learned behavior. Right. What do you mean by that, Pastor Myers? I can assure you that every one of us have a personality. And in some relationships, there are some people who are more proactive. There are some people who are more laid back. And as a, whether in this situation, as a wife, 
if your husband has discovered that he does not have to make decisions because if he does if he hesitates just a little too long you are going to step in and you're going to make it happen. If you've got to call the landlord and say our rent's past due, whenever you were hoping he would be the man enough to pick up the phone and say, we were sick, I didn't make enough money, the rent's going to be late, you have to always feel like you're doing everything. Do you realize tonight that in some relationships that is a learned behavior because your husband has found that you will not... You are going to be the one that if he doesn't step up to the plate right away, you're going to step in there and you're going to make it happen. If you're on the job and you're a trainer of sorts, you're the type of person where that if that person is not putting it on the shelf just right, instead of stepping back and letting them put it on the wrong shelf, showing them the right way, you're going to step in there and you're going to do it yourself. Sometimes the reason why that there are some husbands who have stepped back is because their wife will not let them or have not let them step up and be the man. And so they have just stepped back and let that become the norm in the relationship. And I'm just telling you here tonight that there are other times that the wife, that's not the reason why that their relationship is that way. Sometimes it is the personality of two individuals that are distinctly different. Let me give you some encouragement here tonight to understand something because some of you think there's something wrong with you. Some of you think there's something wrong with your marriage. There could be some things that are wrong. But I want to I want to show you something. You have got to stop comparing your marriage and your relationship to your parents' relationship, to your to your in-laws, your spouse or whoever who somebody else's relationship, your friend, your coworker at work, your best friend's friends twice removed. When you compare your relationship to somebody else, you're doing a disservice to your own marriage because you didn't marry your mama. You didn't marry your daddy. Their relationship is a whole nother bracket because they are two personalities that had to learn how to get along and make things work. You are not your parents. I'm not saying that you should model relationships after successful relationships. I am just trying to help you understand that that it is okay that your relationship is not exactly the same as somebody else's. Let me interject the reason why I tell you that. I've had situations before where that I'd have a wife that would say to me and my wife, I don't understand it. My husband's just not a very romantic kind of guy. You know? I see so-and-so and her husband bought them flowers and... He opens the car door and he says romantic things and he leaves little notes on the mirror after he takes a shower and he, he leaves little notes on the steering wheel and he had, the other day he even had flowers delivered at her work and my husband doesn't ever do stuff like that. I wish, I wish my husband would do those kinds of things. Come on, Bro Myers. Well, can I interject something here that you will hopefully help you? That might be wonderful. But you need to step back and be thankful for what your husband is. What do you mean by that? Because I have had some of the same kind of ladies that would share that with us would be the same kind of women who have husbands who would be at 12 o'clock at night working on their car, changing a starter, when they know that wife's got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go to work tomorrow. And guess what? That's your husband's flowers. Come on and say amen. Well, he's not the kind of person he doesn't he didn't send Withers chocolates to my work the other day like you know so and so's husband does. You need to realize you are not married to their husband. And if you don't start being thankful for what kind of stuff good that your husband does, you're going to live a miserable marriage with the wrong kind of expectations. You need to be able to look and say, How? Well, thank the Lord. I didn't have to take my car down to Goody's uh, Tire Center and spend five thousand dollars to have brake pads and this and that and the other put them because my husband got out in the yard and fixed all that so he didn't bring me a box of chocolates last week but thank god he saved us three thousand dollars last month am i talking tonight does anybody get what i'm saying and that works on the flip side you got to quit looking at your wife and thinking, well, she's not like so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. I have met some people that were picture perfect when it came to looking Photoshop. They had everything just right. You know what I'm saying? 
She looked like Barbie doll model shape. You know what I'm saying? Everybody thought, oh, she's so beautiful. And I've met some of the same kind of people who don't know how to cook a batch of chicken and dumplings. Come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They may not be able to do a lot of other things. Be thankful for what you've got, folks. Be thankful for who you've got. Because if not, you're going to live a very miserable marriage. Say amen to that. Amen. amen. Next question, Sister Myers. How do I allow my husband to lead when he doesn't always make the best decisions? Oh, boy. That is, that is one of the most common questions we have been asked through the years. That office obviously can deepen on uh, the gravity. That can all, all, often depend on the gravity of the decision. Because I'm going to tell you that I believe that God wants you to look at your husband as a spiritual head of your home. But I also do not believe that God expects you to follow you along with your husband in sin either. If your husband asks you to do something that is against the word of God, I don't believe that God expects you to do that. And that may be my opinion, but I believe that. But as much as I hate to say this, sometimes, I'm somewhat touched on this earlier. Sometimes wives, when your husband makes dumb decisions, can I tell you what that's a product of a lot of times? Immaturity. This is bigger of a problem in young marriages. My husband makes the dumbest decisions. I told him he did not need a bass boat. We have rent to pay. I tried to tell him. Let me give you a piece of advice especially you young couples. There are some things you're going to have to deal with because what you have to do in some situations is take a step back. You've offered your insight. You've shared your feelings. Sometimes you've got to let your 25-year-old husband fall flat on his face and be the one to have to call the landlord and say, we don't have it for the third month in a row. So he learns. Because a lot of this is a product of immaturity. Is there any older saints that say, I don't want to embarrass my wife or my husband, but we had to grow through some of that. Anybody? Sure, sure. We've had to grow through some, some of those kinds of things. Yeah. In my younger years, my wife would be the first to tell you, there were times I bought, bought car stereos and fishing poles and things we didn't need. But I was also the guy that had to make up the difference when it was all over with. Yeah, right. Amen. Sister Wendy, you think that this is a spot, part, spot we should probably wind down because I have a couple more questions, but I don't want to overtax people's patience. What do you think? All right. If you're all right, I want to cover a couple more questions. These poor decisions are a product of immaturities. Question number five, Sister Myers. I've been cheated on. Should I stay or should I go? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been cheated on because believe it or not, there's a lot of people that probably would raise their hand even though even though infidelity is a justifiable reason for divorce. Divorce should not be our first choice. Every marriage, you should go into it with a long-haul resolution. And as painful as it is for me to stand up here in front of you and say this, if, if my wife would have decided that divorce was the first answer to infidelity, we wouldn't be in ministry together today. I hate to say that. It's embarrassing. But I've had some situations where that people in relationships, they were already not happy. And they were just hoping something would go wrong, so they had a justifiable reason to get out of the marriage anyway. They didn't try to work things out. They didn't try to show forgiveness or mercy. And I can assure you that infidelity is one of the most painful things you will survive if you do in a relationship. Because every husband or wife that has been slighted feels inferior. Every insecurity they ever had has just been magnified. And I know some folks, they say, Pastor Myers, all them sorry, no good for nothing, cheating husbands. But I got news for you. 
In the last couple of years, we've counseled more couples who the wife cheated on the husband and the husband cheated on the wife. That's right. Believe that. Yeah. Husbands devastated. Hard working men. Yeah. Let me tell you the reason why that this has become such a problem in a lot of relationships in the Western culture is because today rent and housing and everything else has become so insane right. to even survive Come on. that two people are having to work. Yeah. You've got people like nurses pulling 12-hour shifts day in and day out, and they're spending more time with the people they work with yeah. than their own families. Right. you got men who are out there driving semi-trucks up and down the road and only get to see their spouses every once in a while, and it bothers them but that is the only way they know to make the kind of living that will support their lifestyle and their bills and their needs and they're doing everything that they can to survive in that relationship and I can assure you that a lot of these marriage infidelities are often the pro product of not enough time together two people going through a time of a storm and then go to work by Fabio who sits by you in the cubicle next to you he's got on brute by Fabergé Dear God, I hope he's got something else on. No offense to my father, but uh, anyway, I'm so thankful they've come out with some new scents, aren't you? High karate, you know what I mean? But you're sitting by Fabio, and he's got, you know, he, he's got the swag. He's good looking. He's been working out in the gym. He smells good. He agrees with everything you talk about, and one of the most dangerous things you can do is share what's going wrong with your marriage with a person Amen. of the same Amen. gender. Right. Because a male counterpart who is looking for an opportunity, he senses weakness in a marriage problem. One of the dumbest things you can do. Because before you know it, sharing emotional feelings with a person of an opposite sex, the next thing you know, You'll be in an infidelity because a person can take advantage of that. And that is one of the big problems we're seeing today is because of the complexity of our homes and what people are having to deal with. Am I still on the right track? Does anyone understand? Am I still telling the truth here tonight? So even though adultery is justifiable, a reason for divorce, it should not be your first line of defense. It shouldn't be your first choice. It should be a last resort. And I do realize there are some situations where it's unavoidable. Number six, Sister Myers is going to read it to you tonight. I have a struggle with pornography. How and when should I talk to my wife about it? Well, we don't talk about that in church, do we? How often do we hear about that? Right. Vaguely mentioned every once in a while. But I'm going to tell you something. It's one of the biggest problems among men today. Yeah. You'd be blown slap away. I've often wondered to myself what would happen to the church's testimony if Google released all the search records of every male counterpart that went to church. Say amen. amen. Because the reality is, is that there is a lot going on within a person's private life that maybe they can conceal, hide, or otherwise that is damaging to their own spirit and to their marriage. You agree? Say amen. amen. But this person says, I'm struggling with pornography. How and when should I talk to my wife about it? Listen, the level of trust that is needed in a relationship to convey that kind of thing, it's got to be big. Yeah. Because when a man knows that he, has, he is struggling with some thing that in society is a taboo, you will be labeled immediately. You'll be weighed by that for the rest of your life if you come out and say, I've had problems with this. For you to trust that kind of information with your wife, you have to have a pretty good relationship. And not everybody does. And not everybody shares that. So the answer may not always be the same for every couple. I wish I could give you a concrete set example or answer. But I will say this. In an ideal situation, having a spouse that can help hold you accountable is in your favor. If I could just, I'm trying to hurry along because I have a lot of meat to put into this, but several years ago I had a young man, I may have shared this in the past or you've heard me mention, 
But I had a young man that he was struggling in his relationship. He had a real bad problem uh, with lust, and he, he had come to me for reaching out for help and counseling because his wife knew about this problem, but nobody else really knew what was going on. He had an addiction that would cause him every week when he got his paycheck, he would run to a payphone. Anybody remember the 900 number deal that was a bigger issue years ago? And he would spend his entire paycheck. He was a dump truck driver, made a really good paycheck. He would spend his entire paycheck within a matter of minutes at a payphone with somebody he'd never met and then have to turn and call his wife and say, babe, I, I, may, I, I need you to go put some money in, in the bank account. What do you mean? You just got paid. Well, I know, I know, I know, but I, I don't have any, I don't have any money. Can you imagine being a wife having to put up with that, having to deal with that nonsense? But here's the thing: when he came to me, he asked me for advice. I told him, I said, "Son, listen. The first thing you need to do, your wife knows you have an issue." I said, that is your compatibility. That is your complimenting partner. You need to allow her to help hold you accountable. What does that look like? I said, you know where you go when you get your paycheck? Yeah. I said, you know the payphone? Yeah. I said, tell on yourself. Tell her where you go. Tell her how you get away with it. Tell her what you do. Tell her when you do it. I said, because every week when you get paid, tell your wife, call me right at so-and-so time. I said, together, you can overcome. I said, but you have got to be forthright and honest. Because in an ideal situation, when you have a spouse that you can be honest with and share with them that you have a problem, you are never going to overcome that problem with, unless you are willing to be honest and have the kind of people that will support you through that. See, the thing is, is that if you've got a drug addiction or if you've got an alcohol problem, there's not as much of a taboo with that with a lot of people. And so it's not a, as big of a deal to have your wife say, I've got an alcohol problem, I've got a drug problem as well. But when you say you have a pornography addiction, it takes it to a whole other place. Because let me share with you something that wives have to understand. Because believe it or not, there are a lot of wives dealing with husbands who have a pornography problem. And many of them even in church. How do you deal with that, Pastor Myers? Well, first of all, you have to realize that in many cases, it's not your fault. In many cases, is an addiction. And the reason why some husbands cannot go to their wives and say, I've got a problem, is because they immediately assume it's because I'm overweight. I'm not attractive. I'm beautiful. I've had three kids. I've got stretch marks. I'm not the same. You don't find me interesting anymore. You don't love me anymore. There are times where that, that can be true. But in many cases, it is a deep-seated problem within an individual. Sometimes it is because that person feels like that in a relationship they're not getting the affirmation that they need and that is where they're getting their affirmation from. It's a very sad addiction. Very, very sad. And I hate to blow your mind on this, but if you look up statistics here in the last few years, it has gone way in the other direction. The pendulum has swung way the other direction where that now we have more women looking at pornography than ever recorded in statistical history. I don't understand that, but I do know that in the background, anyone else agree with me that the devil is using this to spiritually rob a lot of marriages? So you've got to be able to hold someone accountable and that is in your favor. You have to realize that it's not always your fault. But let me explain something to you and I may get into this in another area. Wives, husbands, realize that both people in a relationship have needs. Whether it's affection, whether it's intimacy, it is something that you entered into a relationship. You both have to understand each other's needs. I will tell you, you would not want to be the reason, wives, that your husband has to result to something else because he feels, he feels there's no affection or intimacy in the relationship. Let me give you a quick example before we read the next one. We had one couple that we were pastoring one time. The man, his wife had called me, said she found out he had been looking at pornography. She absolutely went bananas when she found this out. I mean, ballistic. He's doing this. He's doing that. Blah, blah, blah. And I felt bad because it's wrong. But when I got a chance to sit down with him, 
he began to, with tears, explain to me. He said, Pastor Myers, I don't really know how to tell you this because it's type of stuff that don't sound real spiritual and you don't talk about these kinds of things in church. He said, but there has been no intimacy in our relationship in almost a year. I know that's raw, but folks, listen. If you're working together, you love each other enough that you respect the needs of each other. Your needs might not be the same. The wife needs affection. She needs to know she's beautiful. You can ask my wife. I don't even have to think twice about it. I am all the time whether she believes her or not, telling her how I feel about her. I tell other people how I feel about her because I just love her that much. Yes, they need that affirmation. They need that affection. Right. Now, let me share this with you because I've thought about, I may end up saying this later, but this needs to be said really bad. Real bad. Stop. Stop using it as punishment, as a lack of affection or intimacy in a relationship. What do you mean by that? Well, I will say that if you treat your spouse like trash, they don't really want to be intimate with somebody that treats them like trash. But with that being said, don't roll over to your side of the bed and lay on that little seam around the edge of the mattress and get as far away from her as you possibly can to punish her because you didn't get your way. There's not enough affection in a relationship. And wives, the same way. You can't punish your husband because he doesn't do a certain kind of thing, a certain kind of way, or he didn't act the right way today or whatever. And so I'm, this is your punishment. You are cut off for the next year. I just want you to understand something, that there are ways that we have to be adults about things within that home and the privacy of this union and respect each other's values and needs together. Am I still on the level tonight? Folks, I know this is not popular stuff, but sometimes you've got to get people to bring up things like this because these are real issues that people don't know how to even bring up, but the marriage is falling apart because... They feel like that there is no affection, no love, no intimacy, no togetherness, no support within that relationship. Number seven. We're getting there. As a young couple, we have been hopeful to have children, but instead have been devastated by miscarriage. How do we move on together? Now, I shared with you earlier about the difficulty that we went through in a miscarriage. My daughter-in-law and my son are here both. And uh, they understand how it feels whenever that you're trying, you want a child and you can't, you see other people with one. And you start wondering to yourself, what's the problem? Why? And I don't know if you realize how serious that this question is. Because statistics show people who have lost a child whether through death or miscarriage, don't always survive in marriage. I prayed about it. I asked the Lord to try to help me understand this because we've dealt with this so many different times in pastoring as well. But I think part of the reason why the people don't survive in these situations where they've experienced this as a, as a couple is because some spouses blame the other spouse. Well, you're the one that's not fertile. You're the one that, you're the one that this, or this, this runs in your family. It's because of this. Or what, what happens even more than that is one or both people guilt themselves into depression. Yeah, come on. Something's wrong with me. Come on. I'm not normal. You look around you and you realize everybody else around you seems like that they're blessed hand over fist. Yeah. And all I wanted, God, was for you to give us a child. I want to tell you something. One of the hardest things you'll deal with is the loss. Yeah. Miscarriage. That sort of thing. But I will tell you that you have to learn through prayer together. 
to ride that curve and hardship of a relationship to come out better yes. on the other side. Amen. You ever heard the, the saying before? You cannot have a testimony till you've had a test. Amen. Right? Yes. Can't have a testimony till you have had a test. So I want to tell you tonight, those are hardships that I cannot tell you there's always a concrete cut and dry answer to, but I can share, share with you this, that if you will stick together, we are proof. Come on. We made it. We got through it. Yeah. We'll just say this is the last question. I have lots of things to cover. We'll say this is the last because it's getting late, and I knew that it would be hard to find out how to get this off the ground and where to land it, but go ahead. How do I deal with meeting my husband's intimate needs when I have been raped as a child and still suffer from the insecurities and the feeling violated aspect of it. That's a very sad thing. Yes. We mentioned statistics. If you think about it, statistics show us that there are a lot of young girls and every hundred girls, just the number that have actually experienced something like that in their childhood. Many of them that try to table that, push it to the side. But I spent a lot of time thinking about this particular question because as I mentioned earlier, there has to be a level of compassion and understanding on two parties' part. The person who has been violated, if you got married and you knew that going into the marriage, you have to realize that that person has an injury. If my wife was missing her legs and I married her that way, I understand that this is going to affect, possibly affect our marriage and our relationship for the rest of our marriage. You have to realize that there are some injuries that will, even though that they may heal some, they will go with you the rest of your life. And the reason I say that is because this wife or this person has these struggles of remembering the, the things that they faced during these violations which make their affection and intimacy very difficult. From a biblical standpoint, I feel like the best thing that you could do, number one, sister is remember, your husband is not the one that hurt you. God has allowed you to be together for such a time as this. Together, if you will be honest with each other, you can actually heal together. How do I go about that? Well, first, there are times that you have to share the most intimate things like the triggers, the things that bring back the memories of things that hurt you. If you're willing to be humble and honest enough and say, hey, please don't do this this certain way because it brings back certain memories that I can't hardly deal with. When you love somebody, you're going to have enough compassion that if that bothers them, you're going to learn ways to get around it. Right. But you also have to remember, even though that you've been through some difficulty in your relationship, on the other side of that, your husband is in a, or your spouse, because it can happen to a husband or wife, you are in a monogamous relationship, meaning you're not supposed to step out, you're not supposed to be intimate with anybody else but your spouse. What does that mean? That means that your spouse only has one outlet for intimacy in their life. And if you allow yourself to go on the rest of your life without some level of healing, without even realizing it, you can punish the person that you're with. I believe that at the end of the day, whenever you love each other, these are the kinds of things that when you take them before God that you will find a way to get through as painful and as difficult as they are. 
There are some women, there are some men that have had things robbed from them. Their lives will never be the same. But you have to learn some level of normalcy. And I believe together you can do it. Will you stand to your feet across the house of the Lord? Lots of different things we have discussed tonight. I appreciate my wife for helping me tonight. And I know this service tonight is a little different. It was meant to be. It was supposed to be. I'm hoping that when you walk out of this church tonight that you'll have enough conversation we've engaged in tonight. Subjects that will get you to thinking and bring you to a place where that you can say, Lord, help me in my relationship to be better, to have a better relationship, to be a better husband, to show more compassion, to treat my, my spouse or my companion in such a way that they know that I respect them, I care for them, I love them, so that the obstacles and struggles that we do face or are facing, that we can get through them. And to those of you that may be like my wife and I could say, honestly, we, we have very little issues with our marriage. We've been very blessed. I want you people, whether you're, you have cousins, nieces, nephews, or whoever else, I want you to ask God to give you a level of discernment so that you can pick up on when there are issues. God forbid that someone that you could have stepped in and counseled with or encouraged fell by the wayside, took their own life, or completely fell out of church because we're seeing a lot of that happening, which is one of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing tonight. In closing, what I'd like for you to do, the people that I have reached out to that have shared many of these questions and feelings, some of them are still dealing with a lot of things. I want you to ask the Lord as we get ready to close to encourage them smile down upon them but I also want you to pray for your own marriage if you're grandparents I want you to pray for the relationship of your kids and your grandkids lest they be the next statistic and I ask you in closing tonight is anybody that's a part of this church or been a part of any other church that you knew a couple that were in that were faithful they were really doing well but they started having problems in their marriage and they no longer go to church at all that is reason enough in itself for us to do this tonight. Would you bow your heads across the house of the Lord? And let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for this opportunity to come together. Not, not to converse over the subjects and issues that are affecting many of the relationships that have fallen apart and some of them are dying even as we speak. I'm asking you tonight, God, to allow the things that have been shared tonight to be a wake-up call. God, that we remind ourselves of our need to have the kind of relationship with our spouse that helps us to achieve the goals that you have put in our path to achieve together. I'm asking you that everything that's been said, that you will receive the honor, the glory. Let every seed that's been planted, let it be watered. And God, that you would give the increase. And everyone can say amen. amen. If you're here tonight, you say, Pastor Myers, I really feel like I need to pray. I'm going to give you that opportunity and invitation. But there are some of you, you've got work tomorrow, you've got other things. I don't want you to feel an obligation because I don't want you to do something you don't feel led to do. But if you're here tonight, you say you'd like to pray, you can do that while others are making their way out to the parking lot or coming to the back to eat tonight. Can we give the Lord one great hand clap of praise tonight for His goodness?